Yeah, yeah. View from the North. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and we have Ken Rogers here. He's uh, from uh, uh, British Columbia, Canada, and um, he is going to help us understand what happens in Canada vis a vis the social safety net. Uh, welcome to the show, Ken. Nice to have you. Hello, Jay. So let's uh, let's talk about the social safety net in in Canada. And my sense of it is, um, you know, that in Hawaii, we're, we have a kind of small echo chamber, uh, and we take like surveys in Hawaii and tell ourselves what we're thinking. And then sometimes surveys come in from the mainland, and we get mainland news, and uh, they tell us what the the country is thinking, and that's helpful. But really, for for a, a, a flattened world, um, you know, a world that is uh, in, interconnected. Um, we really need to have more echo in bigger chambers all the time. So we look at uh, look at Mexico, we look at uh, Latin America, we look at Africa, we look at Europe, uh, we look at Asia, and we we want to learn what's going on there. But we also need to look at Canada because Canada is our kissing cousin, if you don't mind. And uh, we need to know how you guys have done these things, uh, concepts that we have, but maybe we haven't done it in the same way. Uh, sometimes your way is better than ours, and I want to explore that with you. So today we're going to talk about the social safety net. Let's start with retirement. Let's talk about social security. Let's talk about retirement plans. How does that work in Canada? Well, very similar to the U.S., that uh, the corporations used to have defined benefit plans or pension plans for their employees. That's pretty well gone now, except for the public service. Uh, the only place where in Canada the um, employee gets a pension that uh, is um, reasonable is from uh, their employer, as if they're a government employee. That includes like a local fireman or policeman or a federal government employee or a provincial uh, employee, uh, the all of the medical people, um, <clears throat> but um, the in Canada we have one very unique thing in that regard called the Canada Pension Plan, uh, and this is a federal program where everybody uh, that is working pay, has a payroll deduction. And so that they, when they reach retirement age, they have a pension. Uh, it's about the same as a typical insurance company would have if you bought a pension plan in the U.S. But uh, the advantage in Canada of having that is absolutely everybody is forced to have it. You know, the the idea of of, of a forced anything is sort of anti-American to some. Uh, members of the U.S. citizenry, and accordingly, you you don't have such a thing. But uh, in that sense, you get when somebody's retired, there is at least a basic start. Well, then in Canada, you also have what's called old age security. You get an old age pension. Uh, now the U.S. has um, has some similarities, but Canada also then has an old age supplement that if uh, your Canada pension plus your old age security and whatever other pension income or assets you have are not enough and you're you know still below the poverty line or you're you know not doing well enough you get this extra supplement so that uh, if you took um, you know a um, person that worked at, uh, you know, $15 an hour for a lot of years, you know, that is a fairly poor wage, let's call it. And, um, you know, but their Canada pension plus old age security plus old age supplement would, would keep them off the street. Um, you know, they would not be at, uh, you know, the, you know, they'd be near the poverty line, but they wouldn't be, uh, you know, <laughs> destitute. Yeah, well, we like, you know, we like to keep people off the street because a destitute person, you know, uh, costs more, costs the government more uh, than a person who's able to get along on whatever the plans are. Let me, but let me ask you some questions about what you just said. So if you work for the government of Canada, you get an automatic pension. 
and the government pays for that, right? Uh, yes, you have a defined benefit plan for pretty generous. Okay. And, and how much do you pay and how much do you get, roughly, roughly? Well, I don't really have good, accurate numbers. I I know, you know, a government, uh, you know, a, a, f a fireman or a policeman that works for a, a local government um, and they retire, they, um, you know, their pension income is uh, is more than half of their um, mm, okay. original that's, income. That's what I was looking for. Also, you know, just so that we have a framework here. Uh, what what is the uh, exchange rate between the Canadian dollar and the U.S. dollar right now? It's a little less than eight, 80 cents, or that is an American dollar's worth about one and a quarter times, or a Canadian dollar's worth 80 cents U.S. Mm, okay, so we were talking in this discussion about dollars. Where, uh, in Canadian dollars, it's only 80, 80 cents American dollars, okay? Um, the other thing is you mentioned that uh, there are some plans that are that you have to get, um, that the law requires you to get them. And who does that apply to? And what does that cost you? Uh, is that, you know, the in the same vein as the government uh, employee plan? You Do you mean the Canada pension plan? Yes. Like, it, like it's a, a payroll deduction, and I, I think it's about 6% um, of the payroll. Okay, and you have to get it. It's going to be taken out of your pay. Yes, and the you know the the pension fund, the Canada pension plan, runs a fund like a normal mutual fund would do. They invest the money and and uh, invest it very conservatively, and they don't earn very much on it over enough years, so that the the payout is not. Uh, something that uh, you jump up and down about if you were a stockbroker and trying to convince somebody how wonderful your management is. Um, certainly, the um, the pay through is is not um, uh, you know something uh, you know fantastic at all. It's really it's a safety net. It's a, it's a requirement that everybody has some basic pension income. I find that interesting because, you know, in the U.S. under FDR, we established Social Security and, you know, you made contributions through your life and sometimes they went up. Uh, and in the end, theoretically, you were contributing to a fund that would pay you back um, a, a certain amount based on what the Social Security Administration and maybe Congress decided. Um, and that would be reliable and stable, uh, subject to increases every now and then. Um, and uh, there have been discussions, mostly among the uh, Republicans in our world, uh, to change that, to outsource it, um, to give it to a money manager, I guess, instead of having the government hold the money and have a, you know, an obligated uh, pay, payout uh, at the end of your career, whenever that is. And so I'm wondering what you think about uh, the Canadian system vis-a-vis -vis the American, you know, we put it in, it stays in a special fund, and it comes out at a specified amount. Um, when you talk about having someone manage the money, you're talking about a GOP plan, which is clearly going to, uh, if that ever happens, it will result in lower payouts, um, you know, to the beneficiaries. Can you compare on that basis? I don't think the fund, whoever's managing the the fund, makes a heck of a lot of difference. The, um, you know, the professionals that the government has managing their pension funds, uh, whether it's the Ontario Teachers Fund or, uh, you know, the Federal Canada Pension Plan Fund, their their management is not much different than the average mutual fund uh, uh, in terms of performance. Uh, the you know it's really when you get overall social security what you need is a is a whole combination of things like the the basic pension is just one piece what do you do uh for example with uh, with poverty um all the way along example single women 
uh, that have children. Uh, you know, you have in the U.S. you you have a um, uh, earned income tax credits, or you have a child tax credit. Well, those are you have to fill in a tax return, and you have to have some work to get to have a credit that makes any sense. Mm. You know, the, the difference philosophy in Canada is we have a child tax benefit, which is just paid monthly. There's just a cash payment monthly. How not many... dedu- it's not a deduction or an exemption. It's just, no, it's... no, it's well, just, that it, but, one... it, but it relates to last year's taxable income. So that if you have um, no income, you, you get, uh, you know, a check anyhow, you know, for every child. Well, that's, that's one of the fundamental points I wanted to raise with you. It just seems to me, and this is over conversations you and I have had many, many times, um, that that the, the Canadian system, although it you know it comes and goes and it has a certain amount of politics as we do, but the Canadian system cares more about people. They care more about the social safety net. They don't want to see anybody on the street or suffering. Am I right about that? Uh. <sighs> Relative to the U.S., yes, but there are countries in Europe, um, you know, the Netherlands, Denmark, the the uh, northern countries in particular, uh, France also, where their level of um, social safety net in total, if you take everything combined, um, is really more generous than the Canadian, and and we simply, in my mind. Uh, watch what these Europeans do and experiment with. And and if something makes sense, we try to copy it. For example, you know, um, uh, you know, pre-care, you know, child care subsidies, you know, should you pay more than $10 a month to have your, uh, you know, child in uh, uh, kindergarten so that women can work. And, and when we have such well-educated women, it's a shame not to be able to have them be able to work if they would like to. Um, so you've got to take the whole the whole package. Uh, you know, for example, the, um, uh, you know, the child, uh, Canada child benefit or family allowance, it used to be called the monthly check. You know, those are, are fairly generous items. You get, you get um, for every single child, you know, 550 bucks a month until they're six years old and 450 a month uh, until they turn 18. Uh, now, if your income is greater than 30 grand, uh, that starts to phase out, but really you still get most of it when your income is still about 60 grand. Um, well, you've got, in addition to that, you have the um, what I call unemployment insurance. Well, the U.S. has unemployment insurance, and Canada has unemployment insurance, and the criteria are almost exactly the same. That is, uh, you get some money uh, when you're out of work, and it's not your fault that you're bounced out of work, and uh, and it lasts for a certain length of time, and it relates to how much money you did earn. Well, the specific numbers in Canada are better than the ones in the U.S. It's just, but they're not as generous as some of the ones in Europe. Mm-hmm. Um, the, you know, for example, in Canada, the um, it's federally administered generally. And so you'd have, um, uh, you'd have about, Oh, I'd say uh, up to 55, it's 55% of whatever your pay was up to about $60,000 a year, um, you know, and, um, and so, you know, in Canada, the average um, payout was about $635 a week. Well, the U.S. program that's managed by the states, and and they're all dramatically different, average 380 a week. Well, the U.S. one lasts for exactly half a year, like 26 26 weeks, if you meet all the criteria and you work for the required length of time. In Canada, it's 45 weeks. You know, that's just kind of the differences. There's just 
minor fine tuning and every couple of years, every rule in the US changes and every rule in Canada changes and they keep going uh, to be better and better and better. Like the US is far better today than it was 10 or 12 years ago and so is Canada. Um, but, uh, you know, when you say better, you mean, you mean the benefits are higher numbers. Higher yeah. Dollars. Are you sorry that, that to, to a Canadian better is, <laughs> uh, having less, less poor people, less poverty, uh, you know, sometimes a lot of Americans don't think that's a good thing. They think if they're poor, they should just suffer. <laughs> yeah, but no, that's, that's coming out. That's, that's part of the, uh. The whole libertarian thing, but let me let me ask you some questions raised by what you were just saying. First of all, uh, let me let me get this straight. In in the U.S., uh, we have um, unemployment insurance uh, state by state, and some, that's why the wide disparity. In Canada, is the unemployment insurance state as province by province, or is it national? It's it's federal, but each province can top it up if they want to. But for example. In the United States, Massachusetts is the most generous on unemployment insurance, and 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 their amount is greater than the Canadian one. Now, like, uh, the last number I saw was a little less than eight hundred dollars, where Mississippi was the worst, and it was about uh, two hundred and seventy dollars a month. You know, well, the Canadian at six thirty-five average, and the U.S. at three eighty average. You know, is you know there, but you've got um, uh, more generous states and less generous states, um, uh, you know, but you still have to count a whole bunch of other factors. For example, uh, a concept of straight welfare. You know, you don't have any income, you don't this, you don't that. Does this state want to keep you with a roof and food or not? You know, and, and Canada has a, you know, if you can plead enough <laughs> and you're poor enough, you can meet the rules. You can get straight welfare, at, you know, and it's not very big, you know, but it's still, you know, six, seven hundred dollars a month for for one person. This this raises the question of homelessness, you know, um, and in the U.S., you can go on the street. You can be in a in a in a pickle where the the government won't help you. Um, you don't you don't qualify for any significant um, support, and you're on the street. And I'm thinking of all these people, for example, that were busted by big health care without insurance or even with insurance. Um, you know, and they went bankrupt and and they have no money. And the hospitals will won't take them beyond a certain point. Depends on what hospital and what state. But there are situations where you get sick and you're on the street and nobody's going to take care of you when you die. Um, and, you know, I mean, that's really awful. But we have that. We have that here. And so the question is, could could that happen? Uh, could this kind of thing without any money and the, the state, you know, or the province, whatever, comes around and says, no, 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 no. We, we're not going to let you go on the street. We're going to take care of you because we know that that's a, you know, that, that's a moral uh, uh and the moral cliff we're not going over. Uh, <clears throat> the best way to describe that is to look at downtown Seattle and downtown Vancouver. Uh, they both have a mega scale tent city. Of, but in both cases, the, the root cause is almost the same. That is, there's drugs and, and lack of looking after mentally ill you know that that if you're to line up who is on the street living in a tent you know they're nearly all um people who especially the ones that i've seen you know in like seattle and vancouver are just absolutely atrocious how how many people there are um living in a tent on the street right in downtown and they tend to make little tent cities or large tent cities they group together and if the authorities come and and move them they move to some other location all as a group and and the process to try to have them moving around but but the the price of housing you know is a big problem um 
Now, Hawaii, but you have such wonderful weather 12 months a year. Um, now, Seattle and Vancouver uh, both do get temperatures that go down to, you know, zero degrees um, Fahrenheit, or at least below freezing Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Um, but, um, you know, you, you still, if you have a sleeping bag, you know, you can live on the street in Seattle or or Vancouver, uh, where you sure couldn't in in other cities like Edmonton or Calgary, and mm. and uh, you know that's much like saying you know in Minneapolis, mm. you know you, you certainly couldn't uh, you know live in that huge city in the middle of the winter, you know, in a tent uh, very easily. Well, you know that's why you know so many people are in Vancouver and Seattle is they've just, they, they've moved there. You know, it's uh, another show, Ken, but I, and I would like to talk with you about how homelessness has increased dramatically, not only in uh, Seattle and Vancouver and San Francisco and LA and New York and so forth, um, but, but everywhere in the country, including Hawaii, uh, and, in, and then everywhere in the world. I mean, it's 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 a, it's a show we should do, uh, you know, down line. But but for me, there's there's got to be um, an explanation of this somehow. It's got to be connected to some significant vectors that we've seen over the past twenty years. Um, it's really remarkable. But let me go back to one other thing you said. Um, and, I mean, or maybe you didn't say, and that is suppose in in American social security, if your spouse dies, you get a payment. For the death of your spouse, if you are um, if you are disabled, uh, handicapped for some reason, Social Security will give you a special payment, and so forth. And I'm sure I'm missing a few things, uh, but um, Social Security has more than simply a retirement benefit all by itself. Does does the Canadian system have more than a retirement uh, payment by itself? Yeah, you have the whole combination of things. One of the uh, most important components is is healthcare. Um, you know where uh, uh, American, you have lots of people go bankrupt because of uh, a health problem and inadequate insurance, like in uninsured people. And the U.S. is gradually getting better and better and better at that. Like their recent legislation to negotiate drug prices is part of it. Well, in in Canada, um, you know, all of the Canadian citizens are covered by the, you know, Canadian health system so that if you have um, cancer, you go to a cancer clinic and, and the government pays for 100% of it. If you have a heart attack, you go, you know, you're in a hospital, the government pays 100% of it. You don't, you know, your relatives don't go bankrupt trying to look after fixing you, you know, having a stint in your heart or equivalent. Um, the, you know, uh, combination of factors to me in so, uh, the Social Security net is a whole list of things, whether you're talking food stamps, you know, which is an American thing. We don't really have food stamps, but you, you have a system of charities that work um probably picking an aside uh one of the neatest safety nets that i've ever seen or heard of was in salt lake city um and i was i lived there for a few years and i lived in a neighborhood where on, i'd say 95 percent of the people were mormon religion and the church sponsored a program whereby if uh you know like under a mormon you have a, a term a mormon pantry and everybody's encouraged to have a pantry of of goods that can keep that would so you could survive for half a year if uh if everything blew up well they they had a particular thing is is if somebody suddenly became unemployed uh members of the same local church uh, they called it a stake with 
but uh, that local group, uh, several people were assigned to look out for that family. And uh, <clears throat> in effect, somebody became unemployed and a truck would roll up to the front door and they would fill up the pantry gratis. You know, but it was not a government program. It was a volunteer program. And even, uh, you know, members of that local church that had um, positions that could get that person reemployed. Uh, you know, if he was a carpenter, you know, who who in the congregation was a general contractor or, you know, built buildings and and that person would be given the responsibility to help this guy find a job or this lady and and uh and it was a, a pretty nifty system uh much like uh you know the way the mayans used to build roads and so on like everybody contributed you know one sixth of their year or one tenth of their year whatever it was uh, to the, the state and everybody was assigned a role according to their capability um you know and and in a sense that's what the uh, mormon church did there and i bring that up since i know there's a fairly hefty mormon element in hawaii and i don't know if they have a dense enough population to to do such a thing there but it was quite fantastic how well this worked and how you know people were just pulled up by their socks and and that um our business there ended up where you know my um, immediate subordinate came to me and said we we need somebody to fill this new job and i says well you didn't have such a thing yesterday when did this pop up you know and it really was that that fellow was a member of the church given a responsibility to help this fellow find a job and and when this guy came on he was not fully qualified for what was needed but not only did the guy who who hired him but the rest of the staff stood on their head and put in extra hours to make sure this guy pulled his weight like they covered him until he was able you know that was part of that system um it's a great that's a lot system better than, that's a lot better than a government system <laughs> well that's 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 what i was going to ask you you know uh when when my wife and i were just dating um her family in Kauai, they were of modest means um had what i thought was a kind of groaning table and every day after the work work time, uh, the people in the community who um, needed food would come around to their home and they would feed my my wife's family would feed them on a, on a regular basis. And this was the way life was in Kauai. I'm not sure that happens so much anymore. I, I don't think it does happen much anymore. And And what I wanted to ask you was, you know, you measure the quality. Um, of the social security system, caring for the poor, you know, the, the, the social safety net, um, by how much need there is in the non-governmental community, how much need is being met in the non-governmental community. So if I, can if I tell you that in a given location of sovereignty, there are fewer charities, whether they be religious or not, uh, feeding people, then what I'm telling you is the government is arguably more successful in that place because it doesn't need, you know, the help of the eleemosynary organization. But if I tell you that there's an enormous number of charities and eleemosynary organizations feeding people um, because they are in crisis, then what I'm telling you too, I think, is that the government is behind the curve, and um, and the government should take note that it is not meeting its social burden. What do you think about that? Well, it's your opinion of what the government's obligation is. Like, you know, if if somebody is able to work but is not working, why should other people pay for that person to have, you know, free room and board? Uh, you know, that's a simple concept so that in, in both Canada and the U.S., uh, 
you know, if you want to give um, straight welfare, um, what do you have to do to qualify? Now, in Canada, you can actually get straight welfare. Um, it's not very big. Ken, this reminds me of Andrew Yang, who ran for president on a Democratic ticket, I guess, uh, back last time. And, and his had thing a guaranteed was, income. Yeah. That's right. So, I mean, a guaranteed income is in, in, arguably going to help people who don't work, who don't want to work, who don't care work, or who can't work. Uh, and, and, you know, it's a statement of the way maybe the future should be operated. Maybe it's a statement of way where Europe is going, you know. We take care of you no matter what. Nobody starves. Nobody is in need. Uh, whether you want to be a, you know, a feather better or not doesn't matter. Um, we're going to, everybody lives the good life or at least a modest life. Um, and maybe that's, maybe that's where it's going. But I, I wanted to ask you, my final question to you today is, you know, there are political forces working on these programs. They don't happen by themselves. They're not purely historical. There are political vectors and forces and, and uh, lobbyists working on these programs, working on the, the side of it that says we have to help everybody, guaranteed income, what have you, guaranteed welfare. And there are those on the side uh, that say, we don't want that. We, we, we take the libertarian point of view. If you want to eat, you got to work, period. Um, and we have that, as you know, and it's accentuated these days under the GOP. Um, we have that in this, in this country, too. And I wonder if you could compare for me the kind of vectors that are happening, the political vectors that are happening in Canada on both sides of, the, of that issue. Um, <clears throat> we don't have a very strong libertarian force in Canada. Uh, we may have in the near future because, uh, you know, our conservative party that is in minority position in the government now, um, their most likely new leader is is pretty small C conservative. Uh, but I don't think that, you know, you have to be in the midstream or you won't get any power in Canada as a party. And I think that uh, electing as a leader, you know, a far right wing leader is simply going to result in the party doing worse than they did last time. <laughs> you know, they only got about 30 percent of the vote. Um, There's however, a certain rationality in, the, in that, you know. Yes, but but you really have um, um, difficulty looking after everybody. And, and your example of the homelessness, the, the tent cities uh, that are growing or the, you know, people living in tents on the street in homelessness, especially in every city where the price of housing is high. Um, you know, that that's not simply a question of does somebody want to work? You know, you have how capable are most of those people to even work? You know, the mental illness question, the drugs questions, those are dramatic factors that affect the very concept of, you know, how many people are living below the poverty line. Well, you may have, um, you know, some disease problem that's dominant. For example, in Canada, uh, we have a, a very large native population. And, you know, they genetically... Um, have pretty adverse effects to, with alcohol. And so you have a huge percentage are alcoholic and they make up a good portion of people living on the streets. And, and, uh, and, and how do you deal with that? It's not like it's, it's a social security net question, but it's not answered with unemployment insurance, you know, child uh, welfare payments, et cetera. I think we're out of time, Ken. Uh, great discussion. Uh, lots of points to drill down on and to follow up in later shows. Thank you so much. Ken Rogers, retired businessman uh, in British Columbia, Canada, comparing notes with us. Thank you so much. Bye, Jane.
Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.